Okay, if you've been up on my site recently, you know, I've been talking about the immune system responses, how can you boost your immune system, all of that stuff. We're getting deeply into the electronic activity within your body, because it is all electronic. And it was never understood before, and even I had to understand how it worked because I do the mud fossils, and I realize how biological things turn into stone, and that is also another product of electronic invasion. It's called nucleophilic substitution, nucleophilic invasion, and I have this particular one here explains exactly how that works. Now, I'm very upset about our health system. The National Institute of Health primarily is, I can't see where they're doing anything good for, for us whatsoever. I, I, I see it exactly the opposite. And you tell me if I'm wrong. Okay, my wonderful friends, 60 Minutes in Australia. This goes back six years ago. I've been looking into the health system, you know, worldwide, and this pertains to a certain procedure that was heavily criticized. Now, listen to this. Watch this. Every 10 minutes in Australia, somebody suffers a stroke. It's our second biggest killer and has left nearly half a million survivors living with crippling disability. But despite the dramatic medical advances in other fields, there's only so much that can be done for a stroke patient, which makes the work of one clinic in America so tantalizing. Its results have to be seen to be believed. The therapy is controversial and heavily criticized, but the patients say it's truly miraculous. Can you please count from one to 10? Every minute of Linda Lumbra's daily life is a frustrating struggle. All right, so this is going to be torturous. Let's just get to where she gets her injection. Okay, here is where he is just going to shoot her up one shot of this drug in Terraset in above the blood brain barrier that's the key she can't get the stuff up into her brain to to dissolve the clots that are in the brain and that's what this does i believe that's the efficacy here now watch her last shot one injection of a drug called etanocept into her spinal cord at the back of the neck what's different ah. a brief few minutes pass to let the drug flow to her brain now they tipped her up like this way so the drug stayed up in her head and I'm, my feeling is is that it, it either recoats the nerve axion bundles to, to, to keep them insulated or it, um, it dissolves some clot that it was in there that just could never get out because it's too big for the blood brain barrier. Not even Linda, or the doctors here, expect what happens next. Okay, did it look cloudy? Now don't forget, they, CVS or whatever, 60 Minutes called him or whoever, I don't know which way it went, but they said come on down and see what happens when I inject somebody, and this is what had, did happen. Uh -huh. Okay, now it's clear. Uh -huh. oh, oh, oh my, hi. It was a bullseye hit on the pathology that was interfering with her brain function. Yeah, you're doing fine. You're doing yeah. super fine. Using etanocept in this way on stroke patients is groundbreaking. So crisp. One, two. The conventional and approved use of etanocept is for the treatment of severe arthritis. Can you bring it up? But Dr. Ed Tobinick has 700 stroke patients who have received this treatment at his Florida clinic. 700. An anti-inflammatory, it attacks or blocks the buildup in the brain of a molecule called TNF, or tumor necrosis factor. In stroke, what happens is there's an inflammatory response, a chronic inflammatory response that is caused by the stroke. Etanership works by neutralizing that chemical TNF, thereby improving the ability of 
brain areas to communicate with each other. Hi, Charlie. Nice to see you. I'm going to give you a few words to repeat. We featured Dr. Tobinick on 60 Minutes in 2011. And can you tell me who is the U.S. president? When he used the same drug, injected the same way, on Alzheimer's patients. Charlie, who, who is the president of the United States? <laughs> Obama. Yes. Dr. Tobinick now claims his unorthodox treatment can aid stroke recovery. Can you feel a little stick just for a second? We see improvements in cognition. We see improvements in motor function. We see improvements in spasticity. We see improvement. Welcome to the world of Hendrix G. All right, I've been following this since that early one, and I want to show you what our CDC or our uh, National Institute of Health has to say about this. It's quite evident that this is beneficial to all the people that have been getting it. They're pretty happy about it. Now let's see what they have to say, what the recommendations are from our National Institute of Health. All right, let's just put a little more detail in here, and then we'll finish this up. Touch your nose. Traditional stroke therapy could only do so much. And after six months in rehabilitation, Linda was sent home. This must have been heartbreaking, watching your wife become this person. When she first came home, she couldn't even do stairs. It was struggled to do the bathing. Couldn't prepare meals. She had a diff very difficult time. And she always was very independent, and it, it was hard. So to see her become the complete opposite of that must have been terrible for you. Well, it, it was like a shock almost. You know, we you thought you know she's going to get better, progressively better, and as time goes on, and yeah, a little bit, a little bit, but not really what I thought as time went on. So it's like, well, maybe this is the way it's going to be, and we need to learn how to deal with this. Well, she'd get frustrated. Linda's twin daughters, Christy and Casey, struggled to accept there was not much more that could be done for Linda. It's hard. My mother was a teacher. That's who she was. And I think it's hard to watch your mother not know who she is anymore. Because that's, she was a mom and she was a teacher. And then when that's gone, she's she trying, a different person. Yeah, she's trying to find her place. Okay, now you want to take this by hand or put it in the bag? No, take it on board. Like Linda, Antoinette Papa from Brisbane knows the pain and suffering of stroke. <sighs> you right there, baby? Yeah. With husband Carlo, she's making the long journey to America for an appointment with Dr. Tobin. For 12 years, she's lived with paralysis and constant pain. All right, let's just skip to and see what happens with her. Okay, here she is now. She's at the clinic and she has post stroke pain, and you can see she's not very right. mobile. One of the most crippling effects of stroke for which there's little treatment. No. The shoulder pain, is that something you have every day? Yeah, just about every day. Yeah. But if I try to move your wrist up, is that uncomfortable? Yes, it is. Yeah. Just a little motion is uncomfortable, okay? It's, it's really tight. Antoinette is also somewhat of a guinea pig. She'll be the clinic's first stroke patient to undergo a sophisticated 3D brain scan following the injection. Well done. To see how blood flow and activity are affected or improved by the drug. When Linda Lumbra suffered a stroke three years ago, she lost her speech and struggled to walk. And like so many stroke victims, rehabilitation could only do so much. But then she heard about a controversial injection that was reducing the effects of stroke. It isn't fully tested and is viewed cynically by many neurologists. But that hasn't stopped Linda and the results are something to see. What's different? All right, we already saw this one. Let's, they're they're going to drag this out because they got 22 minutes here. <laughs> Let's find that other lady and see how she made out. Okay, now the uh, neurologists are fighting back against this treatment. They say, you know, don't do it and, and so forth. I'll show you the paper that was written by the NIH. Very disturbing, actually, to be perfectly honest. I feel we have no reason not to jump for joy. You're not jumping for joy. Unfortunately, I'm not jumping for joy because the evidence is not there. Still uncomfortable if we touch it? Dr. Tobinick acknowledges his treatment won't work for everyone. 
It's only another few minutes. He says one in five will show no significant response. Q, cluster, a state. Out of the hundreds of his patients who have shown improvement, many, like Linda, are quick to answer the critics. I, I remember how to read. I, I don't get it, because have they viewed any of the people who have agreed to be taped when they've received the treatment? Have they read anything? Have they talked to any of us? Because I invite them to. I would tell them to take a look at me. How much more proof do you need? They think. I'm going to tell you right now, the, the scientific community, the medical community, all of our leaders basically now are, are um, denialists of everything. They, they only want to maintain their ability to make money and to control us. Basically, that's what I have found. I discovered this when I tried to present my evidence to Yale University, Harvard, all of them about my mud fossils, undeniable DNA, CAT scans, anatomist, chemistry, the whole nine yards, and it still refused to this day. Now, there's a lot of words I could use to describe those people. I won't use them because they could be legal terms that would get me in trouble. But I can tell you what, every one of the words I'm thinking of right now apply to virtually everybody that is in a power, a position of power. It's disgraceful, really, now. It seems too good to be true, sounds too good to be true, but if you just look, there's no denying it. All right, there's no reason to go any further. She's 100% right. This guy has, they, he said one in five will not see any significant improvement. That's much better than the medical society. They think it's zero for them. Now, that woman was treated in 2011 and this is 2016, practice advisory and terror set for post-stroke disability. And let's just cut right down to the chase. What do they recommend? Putting the evidence into a clinical context. We have very low confidence in the evidence for efficacy, means does it work or not, of this interoceptive for post-stroke disability because of the high risk of bias of the relevant studies. In other words, people are hoping they're going to get better and just all oh, but they do, so it can't be real. The biological plausibility of benefit was judged to be low because of the reported immediate onset of benefits. Too good to be true. How could this possibly be so fast? Forget about it. Walk away and leave them to be in stroke for the rest of their lives and single administration of a transiently acting medication. That is one medication, they're fixed. Explanation other than the eff effectiveness of the treatment for the observed improvements include observer expectation, performance motivation, regression to the mean, and the placebo effect. These are all they're just crazy people thinking that they're getting better. This is, it's unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable what their recommendation. Here's their recommendation. Clinics should cons consult patients considering the terms of for treatment of post-stroke disability that there is insufficient evidence to determine the effectiveness and the treatment may be associated with adverse outcomes and high costs. Listen to this, it costs $440. <laughs> It costs four hundred and forty dollars for a shot. Look, as of this writing, the cost is of interoceptive is four hundred and forty dollars, <laughs> and they can have their to be, be in a stroke condition for the rest of your life. Save your four hundred and forty dollars. Additional cost could be associated with pre-treatment evaluation, where they have to say, hey, hey, "Oh boy, I'm telling you, this." Is, and now this is our National Institute of Health, our government, saying to you. Don't get treated for this. This guy's a crazy person. And they still, right now, as far as I know, there's, this is still the recommendation. Tell them not to do it. They're crazy to do it. All right, let's talk about the National Institutes of Health again. In 2011, they knew about probiotics, and they, it, this is exactly what it says. From 2011, they dropped the ball. New, National Institute of Health, again, recent findings back then, 10 years ago, probiotic genomic and proteomic studies have identified several genes and specific compounds derived from probiotics which mediate immunoregulatory effects, immunoregulatory effects. 
Studies regarding the biological consequence of probiotics in host immunity suggested that they regulate functions of the systemic, that's your whole body's immune system and mucosal immune cells, intestinal epithelial cells, all of the things that make you healthy. Thus, probiotics showed their therapeutic potential for disease, including several immune response related diseases, such as allergy, eczema, viral infection, and potentiating vaccination responses, increasing the goodness of the vaccines. This is 11 years ago. Nobody ever talked about that. Now, here we are in 2021. This is just a few months ago, back in May. Same thing again. Evidence supports probiotics role in regulating the immune system, suggesting a definitive, absolute, no question whatsoever role for probiotics in viral infections. Probiotic supplementation could reduce the severity of COVID-19 morbidity and mortality. Probiotics can inhibit cytokine storms by simultaneously boosting your internal innate immune system and evading the exaggeration of trying to adapt to your immunity because you can't do it because this is a brand new novel disease and it takes time to, to build immunities to new diseases. And this is so aggressive, you don't have time. So that's the challenge to respond quickly to this viral onslaught. Probiotics induce suppression of the inflammatory cytokine response may prevent both severity and occurrence of acute respiratory disease syndrome, making probiotics an attractive adjunct. I, have you heard one single word about probiotics? None. And guess what? They're not even doing any trials. This is 10 years ago they knew it. Here we are a few months ago, they still know it again. And therefore, supplementation of probiotics in high risk, so you should give them to anybody that's in high risk, severely ill patients, give them to them too. Any frontline health workers, give them to them, might limit the infection and flatten the COVID-19 curve. However, currently there are no random control trials to demonstrate conclusive effectiveness. But they say, on the other hand, it certainly seems like it's good. On the other hand, circumstantial evidence has supported the presumption that probiotic supplementation decreases the severity of COVID-19, including mortality. Zero words. Zero. If you have heard anybody say one single word about probiotics from our government, from Fauci, from the National Institute of Health, the CDC, anybody, one single word about probiotics, I'd love to hear it because I haven't heard a single syllable about probiotics. This is our government. Don't get yourself treated for stroke. Yeah, $440. You could lose your all that money. And, you know, who knows? But they'll treat you for cancer and for millions of dollars while they watch you die because you're being invaded because you don't have the probiotics. It's a disgraceful situation. Absolutely disgraceful.